Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest installment of the Penn Project on the Future of US-China Relations. I'm Jacques Delisle. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us on the fifth of our six webinars on various aspects of the relationship. On behalf of my colleagues, Avery Goldstein, my predecessor as director here at the Center, and Nason Makbubi, a research fellow at the Center, uh, who is my governor, uh, two co-organizers, three co-organizers on this project. I'd like to welcome you to today's event, which will focus on environment and climate change. First, a few words about the project, which many of our uh, loyal uh, listeners and, and, and participants will, will know, uh, but others may not, is just explain a little bit about how we got where we are with this. The idea of this project is to address our current rather fraught moment. Uh, for a decade or so now, we've seen a significant downward trend in US-China relations. And we've seen the, the bipartisan consensus in favor of constructive engagement, belief in a positive relationship between the US and China unravel. In its place is a future we don't yet know, but one of the concerns is that we may be headed toward a new Cold War. That is dire and we believe somewhat overly simplistic because over the past 40 years, the US-China relationship has become extremely multifaceted, complex, and dense. Uh, so it's really not analogous uh, to the former US-Soviet relationship. And making policy in this environment of a more difficult and more conflictual relationship, but one that retains uh, many facets, making policy in that context requires deep expertise in particular areas of this complicated relationship. To that end, we have assembled 20 scholars, mostly younger generation scholars who have a great deal of depth and expertise in particular areas of the relationship. We've asked them to write policy papers and engage in dialogue that focuses on their particular areas of expertise. Not only because that's the nature of the relationship, but because we believe that is also an area where we can have a fruitful discussion and hopefully uh, useful policy innovations in ways that do not get caught up in the Cold War versus some attempt to restore uh, some status quo ante. And you've seen, if you've been watching uh, our, our uh, project, you've seen four of these webinars already. There's one this week and a final one uh, next week. Uh, we have been posting all of the policy papers on the website for the project. We've also been posting the videos of these sessions. So if you want to see more or, or refresh your recollection on things you've already seen, I urge you uh, to go there. So let me uh, just get a couple of uh, logistical uh, matters and some thanks out of the way, and then I will turn it over to my colleague, Avery Goldstein, who'll be chairing today's session and will introduce today's panelists. First, in terms of mechanics here, uh, this is being done as a webinar. If you wish to raise a question, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, and our moderator will get to those as much as we can. Please keep an eye on the chat box. You, will, you as a webinar participant will not be able to put things into the chat box, but you will find useful information, or at least what we hope is useful information there, including how to access the papers, uh, how to submit questions, uh, and other such things. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Avery after offering just a few words of thanks. First, again, thanks to Avery Goldstein and to Nason Mahbubi, my partners in crime on this. Thanks to all uh, 20 of our uh, policy paper writers. Uh, and thanks to the financial support provided for this project from the China Research and Engagement Fund run out of Penn Global and the Penn's Pro Provost Office and to the Henry Luce Foundation. I'd also like to thank uh, two people who don't show up on your screen or our weekly gatherings here, but who really do make this possible. Uh, Yun Yan Zhang, who is the Associate Director of our center, and Amanda Morrison, who is the fellow for this project. So without further ado, let me pass it along to Avery. Hey, thanks, Jacques. Um, uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, which as Jacques indicated is on uh, climate and the environment, climate change in the environment, and uh, how this pertains to US-China relations in this new period. Uh, let me just uh, offer a few comments at the very beginning here, which is to introduce the topic. Uh, other than the immediate effects of uh, the COVID pandemic and the challenges we all face in dealing with it, uh, really the problem, I think it's generally recognized that the problem of climate change uh, confronts the world with what is arguably the greatest challenge of the 21st century. It's a challenge uh, in which the choices that the United States and China make will be crucial, if not decisive, whether those choices are made separately uh, or through joint efforts, because these two countries are the homes to the uh, world's largest two economies, by far the largest two economies, they will be responsible for whether and how broadly shared international interests in both greater prosperity and sustainability are reconciled over the coming decades. Today, our panelists bring to bear their expertise both on US-China relations and climate and environmental concerns to assess where things stand, 
suggest where they may be headed, and to offer a few recommendations. Uh, I'll introduce all three panelists, and then I will uh, have each of them say uh, a thing or two about their, uh, their papers on which today's comments are going to be based. Um, and I will ask a few questions, and we'll do that in sequence, one at a time, so that people are able to begin to think about the questions they may want to pose in the Q&A uh, box on their screens. Uh, let me introduce all the panelists, as I said I would. Uh, first, uh, Alex Wong, who's a professor of law at UCLA School of Law and a leading expert on environmental law and the law of politics, uh, law and politics in China. Uh, prior to 2011, he was a senior attorney for the National, Resource, National Resources Defense Council, NRDC, based in Beijing and the founding director of NRDC's China Environmental Law and Governance Project. Uh, second speaker today will be Deborah Seligson, who's an assistant professor of political science at Villanova University. Uh, prior to receiving her PhD in political science and international affairs, uh, she worked in both the NGO and government sectors on energy, climate, and the environment, uh, including working in Beijing from 2007 to 2012 as principal advisor in the World Resources Institute's China Energy and Climate Program. Uh, and for over 20 years, she was working uh, with the United States Department of State on energy and environmental issues in China, India, Nepal, and New Zealand. Our third speaker will be Jonas Nam, who's an assistant professor of energy resources and environment at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His interests focus on the intersection of economic and industrial policy, energy policy, and environmental politics. And prior to joining Hopkins Sice, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. So without uh, any further delay, we're going to have our first paper presented, and then I'll ask a couple of questions of uh, Alex Wong. And uh, Alex, uh, you're up. Uh, thank you again, Avery and Jacques and Nason uh, for organizing this terrific event today, and as well, uh, all the papers and uh, talks in this series. Now, my paper uh, is a call for US and China to reinvigorate climate action through a joint commitment to carbon neutrality by mid-century. When I began writing this paper earlier this year, the EU was the most significant jurisdiction to have made such a pledge. Uh, my state of California had also made a similar pledge. Uh, earlier this year, the prospects for national carbon neutrality goals from the US and China looked bleak and uh, looked distant, uh, if anything. And at that time, if anything, the US looked like the country more likely to move first, given signals in the Biden's platform. It would be very dependent on what happened in the up upcoming election. Uh, but last month, uh, Xi Jinping of China made a surprise announcement of a 2060 carbon neutrality uh, target. So China has clearly taken the initiative in this way, uh, but critics have suggested that China's pledge is greenwashing and have asked if there can be any accountability for a target uh, so, so many years in the future. My paper uh, essentially argues that China is more likely to be able to achieve such a target than is commonly supposed. I take the specific example of coal to illustrate this. Coal makes up almost 60% of China's energy mix, and that would ha essentially have to be largely eliminated over the next three decades in order to achieve the, tar uh, the target. And I can elaborate on the reasons, but my main point is that China has a number of self-interested reasons for acting on climate change. And these reasons are environmental, but also in significant part economic and political. Uh, this, uh, we have to acknowledge, is also the way that the uh, Chinese party state officially presents it, that this is a self-interested thing. But the way I frame it is, is uh, slightly different than the way that the official line uh, frames it. Moreover, I point out that the fundamental economics of re renewable energy have shifted in such a way that it's simply cheaper in many places to use renewable energy, even if you don't uh, calculate in the harmful social costs of coal. Now, uh, as for US-China dynamics, I mentioned two uh, angles in the paper. First, I argue that how the two countries handle climate change matters a great deal for national reputation and soft power. If China can deliver on its carbon neutrality goal, it'll present this as validation of its particular approach to governance. Uh, this matters both for domestic and for global audiences. Uh, we've seen how this has played out in the COVID response, uh, which has been presented as a referendum on governance competency and legitimacy. Uh, and to that point, it matters a great deal how the US responds on the issue on climate change. Uh, this will make a tremendous difference to how the Chinese response is viewed. A continued sclerotic res uh, US uh, response will allow China to burnish its reputation and to present itself as the more constructive international player. 
If the U.S. is successful in acting on climate change, it'll allow the, uh, the U.S. to claim the same benefits for itself and at minimum not to uh, allow itself to fall back on these points uh, relative to China. Second and finally, my uh, paper argues that the traditional view of climate change as a global prisoner's dilemma is shifting. Uh, for those not familiar with the concept, this is the idea that both countries would benefit uh, and be better off by cooperating, but that a fear of the other side cheating or defecting means that doing nothing is the more likely default position. Uh, so I, I argue in the paper that a number of factors, including the worsening effects of climate change, we've seen the, the uh, wildfires, the uh, extreme storms, these types of things, uh, economic opportunities from clean technology industries of the future, and this global competitive and reputational, uh, the, the dynamics of global uh, competition and reputa uh, reputation all mean that the benefits of unilateral action are greater than they ever have been before and that non-action is no longer the comfortable default position that it once was. Uh, and finally, if the US and China collaborate, I see it as a way that the countries can maximize and accelerate the benefits of a move to carbon neutrality. It'll create uh, a, a massive markets for the products and services that are part and parcel of this sort of transformation, and it will help bring the rest of the world along on climate change as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop uh, there, Avery, and hand it back to you. Okay, uh, great. That's a good uh, quick overview of the paper. I encourage people to take a look at the paper itself. Um, and uh, for those who have seen uh, these webinars before, the first one on national security, I warned the participants that um, some of my questions may seem a little bit pushy or confrontational. I don't mean it to sound that way. I'm just trying to encourage people to think hard about these issues. Um, let me begin with this idea of the goals for carbon neutrality by mid-century, whether the United States or China. And um, to somebody who doesn't really study these things very closely, but cares about them, um, sometimes these goals can seem like cheap talk because they're so far into the future. I mean, I realize three decades is really not that far, but three decades is still far enough uh, that it can sound a little bit like cheap talk. It's kind of like saying, well, I'm going to quit smoking five or 10 years from now. I mean, so uh, would it make sense, uh, or in fact, maybe these things have been done and I don't know about them, to set um, interim goals rather than these long-term goals as benchmarks um, so that there could be kind of frequent checkups to know how the US, China, and other countries are doing and what effect it's having uh, on climate change. So Alex, if you right, comment yeah. on so, that. So the, the idea of interim targets, of course, that's, that's the way that uh, jurisdictions who have pledged to do this, how, how they move forward, right? They said interim targets of various sorts, but it, it's probably worth putting on the table what exactly it would mean to get to carbon neutrality. It feels pie in the sky. Uh, a lot of people, when discussing this, if, if you're not following the environmental area, it feels like something that's impossible to achieve because it's about all of the basic things we do in life. And so you, you only have to look at jurisdictions, say, if you take a look at California as to how they're approaching, California has a 2045 carbon neutrality target. So what does that mean in practice? It means transforming the energy sector. So it doesn't mean not uh, using energy, uh, as some of the people who are more scaremongering mong might suggest, it means producing energy not through coal and natural gas, but through renewable energy, right? Vehicles, it means doesn't mean not driving at all, it means uh, using an electric vehicle versus a gas-powered vehicle. Buildings, it means getting your heating through electricity rather than gas. These types of building blocks are all parts of it, and you only need to look like at a jurisdiction like California to see the way that these things are being implemented step by step. It's not to say that these things are easy, but there are targets and there are ways that are well are increasingly well known as, as to how to achieve it. There are difficult spots like industry. I think you know how do you generate the heat to produce steel and cement that are still farther along, uh, you know, in, in, or not as far along in terms of learning how to do it without coal and, and, and carbon emissions. But uh, if you actually look at what's going on, it's a lot more, seems a lot more feasible than I think most people realize. Great. Um, you and indeed all three papers uh, that are gonna be discussed today um, make a powerful case for collaboration or cooperation between the United States and China and why it's desirable. Um, and you mentioned the prisoner's dilemma and some of the reasons why this uh, may not be the best way to think about uh, the US-China dealing with uh, climate change problems. Um, so it's desirable to have this cooperation, but I'm wondering if in fact it is feasible given the 
uh, general hostility in the bilateral relationship over the past few years. Uh, maybe to put it differently, is there a constitu constituency in the United States? Uh, and is there a constitu constituency in China to support this kind of close cooperation? Uh, or is it possible that the people that really uh, have the influence over policy in relations between the two countries on a range of issues um, will not focus on the absolute benefits of progress on uh, climate issues, but that instead they will worry that um, cooperating on some of these goals pursuing climate uh, concerns uh, will in fact yield relative gains for the other side in the economic or political, in the political rivalry they have or in their economic competition. Uh, and therefore will be reluctant uh, to pursue what in the abstract, or at least in just one dimension, looks like desirable uh, efforts to fight climate change. Yeah, so I, I think in, in raising the prisoner's dilemma, my point is to suggest that we're talking about collaboration. We need to unpack what that means a little bit. I don't think that it need, it requires the type of uh, close coordination that uh, some people think would be very difficult to accomplish. I think we're saying that, I'm, I'm suggesting that both countries uh, have self-interested reasons to move forward. Uh, idea sharing is very important uh, and on that level can help push things forward. And another thing to note, and I think Debbie will be talking about this, is that the type of collaboration that I'm thinking about has already, has, has actually continued under the Trump administration, but at different levels of government less so at the federal level of government. But for example, again, to use the example of California, there's been a lot of sharing of ideas, brainstorming, how to figure out how each country can bring strengths to achieving what is still a difficult puzzle to solve, right? So that is something that both countries are still interested in doing. And if each side believes that there are advantages to competing and trying to achieve success in promoting uh, these particular industries, then each side should feel that uh, trying to do their best to, to, to push these things forward is the way to go rather than holding back in, in some ways. If you believe that you can gain the sort of reputational advantages of acting on climate change, the economic advantages of developing these industries, these are the types of things that I've highlighted and I think have changed a lot in the last decade that uh, mean that uh, it's, the fear of the other side not doing something is not as much of a barrier as it once was. Okay, my last question for you, at least for now, uh, is that in the paper you discuss um, vested interests uh, in China and the United States who, who favor moving away from fossil fuels and other uh, problematic practices. But what I was wondering as I read that was whether um, they represent these vested interests which exist rep are well represented on key decision-making bodies uh, at the, least at the national level, both within the Communist Party and the state organs in China uh, or in the United States government. In other words, whether the uh, vested interests in favor of making these kinds of uh, efforts to fight climate change have the kind of political clout when hard decisions have to be made about uh, allocating resources and implementing new policies. Yeah, of, of course, this is going to be the, the challenge, right? I, you know, that's a, a natural question for you as a political scientist to be asking, right? Uh, with respect to that in China, you know, I hedge a little bit there because it's hard to know what's going on, right? There's, there's a, it's opaque enough that um, it's hard to uh, figure out exactly where the balance is. And of course, in the US, we know this is a difficult political issue as well. It came up last night in the debate, right? When uh, Biden's comment about transitioning away from oil and the discussions about fracking, these all reflect the particular politics of fossil fuels in the United States. Again, to, to use the example of California, arguably one of the reasons you've been able to politically move forward uh, so aggressively on the carbon neutrality and the climate change goals is in part because you have a lot of companies that benefit from that, right? You, that's, of course, I, I believe that California leaders are doing it for the environmental reasons, but there is also a constituency that has built up uh, over the years. And, um, you know, where that balance is exactly at the US federal level in China, we can, we can discuss and we need to understand better. But uh, I think we have examples now that it's, it's certainly possible. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Alex. And I hope people uh, who didn't hear me ask the questions they wanted will put their questions in the Q&A box. So we're going to turn now to the uh, second speaker, Deborah Seligson, uh, who uh, has a paper on the uh, site for this project, uh, co-authored with uh, Angel Xu. Um, and uh, 
Debbie, if you come up on the screen, unmute yourself, uh, you can uh, introduce people to your paper. Hi, thanks. So uh, yeah, I wanna make sure we give um, credit to Angel Shu, who's a assistant professor at Yale and US and um, a key driver behind this paper. And what Angel and I wanna talk about is how do we build back to a more constructive US-China climate relationship? And we think there are three really important elements to this. The first, and this is really response to a number of things I've heard from people who are hoping they're coming into a new administration, is that it, it, we can't just assume that the US can resume leadership um, in global climate negotiations without doing some hard work of our own first. That um, we have now pulled out of um, international climate agreements, not once, but twice. And that first the Kyoto Protocol and now the Paris Agreement. And so trust from international actors is pretty low at this point. And that's not a China only problem. So other countries really want us to do something, but they want us to show that we're doing the work. And we have to recognize that over the last four years when um, the Trump administration has pulled back on really important important climate efforts, not just the Paris Agreement, but the, um, the clean power plan, reducing cafe standards, that other countries have been moving forward. And again, that's countries around the world, not just China, but China has been doing quite a lot to gain co-benefits from reducing local air pollution and improving its um, carbon mitigation, and now it has this 2060 goal. So it's actually been moving forward while we haven't. And so we really need to think about the elements and they're all there in certainly a Biden plan in terms of this Build Back Better plan. There is an approach to showing um, real effort from the US. And so I would strongly suggest that the first move not be fly out to Beijing and try to negotiate a new MOU, but the first move needs to be introduce some legislation in Congress. The second thing is that we think that the a focus on winning coalitions is the way to rebuild trust and cooperation. And this really means thinking about a new paradigm on climate mitigation where we're focused on industrial policy rather than um, cap and trade or carbon tax. We already see this in um, the Biden-Harris Build Back Better plan. It's in all of the various proposals of the Green New Deal. And we think the Green New Deal, while Biden doesn't like to use that terminology, is the framework. Because essentially what it's suggesting is that you invest in the positive things you want rather than tax the negative things you don't want. And while this may not sound perfect to economists, it's brilliant in terms of changing precisely those interest groups that Avery and Alex were just talking about, that you create the interest groups for positive change. Alex was talking about all of the, um, you know, essentially solar lobbyists in California, you can create solar lobbyists and wind lobbyists and energy efficiency lobbyists all over the country if that's what you fund. And that really changes the political dynamic. It also makes cooperation with China easier because the Chinese have always had a green industrial policy. And so our two countries' policies will be more aligned. The other thing that we focus on is that you can build from the bottom up, that because we have had all of this subnational cooperation, much of which has continued, and this has been both states, especially California, um, some cities, and also um, companies working with Chinese partners, they, um, that's an important area for a new national policy to look at and to build from rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. And of course, in the event of a second Trump administration, we really need to focus on these and we need to think about ways to even build them up because it's really gonna be all we have. Finally, I think there's a way to think about 
cooperation that doesn't deny the fact that, that competition is going to be fundamental. That, and perhaps the analogy here is the World Trade Organization where you cooperate on a set of rules and then you compete like crazy in terms of trying to sell your goods and services. Both of these countries are going to have industrial policies to meet green ends. Both of these are gonna be creating an enormous number of green products and green systems that they're gonna be trying to sell around the world. This is going to drive down the price of cleaner options, just has all the competition so far and wind and solar has driven down prices. And so we have to recognize, we're not just talking about sort of harmonious cooperation, we're talking about setting standards and goals that then allow countries to compete to be greener rather than compete on other parameters. And indeed, of course, they will continue to. And just because the um, prisoner's dilemma seems to be getting a lot of attention, I mean, thinking about the winning coalitions is a way to think well beyond prisoner's dilemma. But I would suggest um, when I teach intro IR that prisoner's dilemma was never the correct game for um, climate change. It's really a stag hunt where if you each act alone, you gain a certain amount. But if you act together, you can gain a great deal more, being that uh, alone you get a rabbit and together you get a stag. So um, maybe that's a little too gory. I don't know. But the point being that there is room for unilateral action. There's room, especially in terms of setting rules of the game for working together and acknowledging that this will be working together in a spirit of competition. Avery, you're muted. Got it. Yes, I've unmuted myself. Um, um, let me pick up with this idea of winning coalitions because I think that's a powerful part of the paper that the two of you wrote. Um, and you emphasize how you can uh, put together these winning coalitions in favor of uh, green industrial policy by uh, highlighting the uh, benefits, the jobs, the profits from embracing these new approaches rather than emphasizing carbon taxes, other kinds of costs that would punish existing fossil fuel to get people to shift out of those problematic industries. So when I read that, I thought to myself, that sounds, it sounds reasonable. Uh, but if this is such a clearly winning formula the, and result, would result in win-win outcomes within the United States, at least, uh, for capital, labor, and the environment, um, why hasn't it already happened? Well, you have a Republican Party that doesn't believe in um, spending money. And the way you create these winning coalitions is by moving toward a subsidies policy rather than a tax policy, right? So that's what Build Back Better is, right? It's a $2 trillion policy to try to create um, momentum for cleaner energy. We had a start to that in the, um, in the, in the Recovery Act after the financial crash and it, that was the largest investment we've had in green energy. But in the United States, we've been very inconsistent in supporting green energy. But it's been interesting that even in the US in Republican states, many Republican states have renewable energy portfolio standards. So this is a way to encourage green energy by just setting a quota for power companies. And it, they're popular with voters, they're popular with voters of both the left and the right. Once these kind of stealthily became popular, this, group, this right wing group called ALEC that tries to propose um, legislation at the state and local level to promote its goals went after a lot of these in Republican states. And so it's, it's about oil industry funding, but you know, two tr trillion dollars could make a difference in who has the upper hand. Okay, well that leads actually directly into my next question, which is um, for those who haven't seen the paper, um, you, know, you, you begin fairly early in the paper uh, laying out this idea of the way the Green New Deal is uh, uh, a good approach for the United States. In fact, I would argue that um, in contrast maybe to the position that um, Joe Biden has laid out in, 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 his pla in the Democratic platform and his comments uh, publicly recently, um, that your version of the Green New Deal is kind of the full Monty version uh, because you include social equity and justice components. And when I read that, you know, regardless of my own personal views on these matters, 
I ask myself, is this politically viable uh, in American politics? Will it get enough buy-in from, you talked about oil interests, uh, enough buy-in from the wealthy and powerful who are actually gonna shape the policies uh, that will uh, determine whether such a Green New Deal can be embraced or is in fact the term Green New Deal at this point uh, politically toxic among some sectors of the uh, uh, political spectrum? Um, and that if what you need is to build a coalition beyond what you might label the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, um, is, you, you know, is invoking this broad idea of the Green New Deal, not the narrow version of it, uh, is it viable if what you want to do is make progress? So the, um, the, the justice issues that we raise in the paper is this part on just transitions, which is how you actually ensure that people working in these industries that are dying have new opportunities. And that actually is in um, Biden's platform. I mean, there's a whole part on justice in there. He has like three different um, environment and climate sections. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's the most organized design that I've ever seen. But, um, but so I think ensuring that people have opportunity, dealing with people who are left behind. I think that's pretty strong. I think you're absolutely correct that the Green New Deal itself as a label has gotten incredibly, um, it's been railed against long enough that it's gotten tarred. Um, if you read the Green New Deal legislation, it's like 14 pages long. It's just a general outline saying that we should do a lot of good things. So people are able to impute whatever they want on it. But in terms of what Biden's proposing, he's proposing a strong industrial policy and he's absolutely proposing addressing some of the costs of being left behind. And I think, you know, the other work that we I've done with other research partners on the political costs of um, not paying attention to those that were left behind in terms of you know China's entry into the WTO suggests that that's absolutely something that I think any democratic administration is going to have to pay attention to that you can't just assume. What we think is interesting and new is the Chinese have typically not paid attention to that, right? They've moved industries around and they've let millions of people become un unemployed and just assume that economic growth will take over, right? But but economic growth was slowing pre-COVID. And so we think looking to the future that the Chinese are also gonna be looking for solutions to ensure that they don't have a lot of unhappy coal miners and people working in um, antiquated fossil fuel dependent industries. So we think this might be an area where there's some useful sort of sharing that could go on. Obviously, each country would do it its own way. So actually, that takes me right to what was going to be my last question at this point anyway, uh, which was that the paper and you just now seem to suggest that this question of just transition means figuring out how to deal with people who would otherwise be left behind by the uh, transformation we're talking about. Um, but that kind of implicitly or maybe explicitly assumes that um, there wouldn't be a net loss of jobs as a consequence of shifting to a more climate friendly industrial uh, policy. Um, but doesn't that assume that um, the new industries won't be less labor intensive? In other words, uh, maybe you know, either because of automation or for other reasons that have to do with wage structure and whatnot, um, that maybe people you know, will be left behind or at least we'll see their incomes decrease because uh, they're not going to be able to find jobs in new green industries that pay them as well as they were being paid when they're working and you know, doing the awful job that, that coal miners have to do. So how, how, do, you, how do you know that um, there is a way to manage the just transition in a way that, that'll be politically feasible and economically sensible? Well, I think Jonas is actually the person who knows the employment numbers probably better than I do. But I've never seen any data suggesting that um, renewable energy employs fewer people than fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are very capital intensive. And of course, the way we mine coal in the United States these days is specifically to reduce the amount of labor. We lop the tops off mountains in West Virginia, which oh my goodness, is the most stunningly beautiful place on earth if we don't do things like lock tops off mountains. 
Um, you know, so, but I think the issue is not really about whether there are more jobs in one or the other. The issue is that the jobs are never going to be in exactly the same places, right? It's not the case that the massive growth of renewable energy is going to be in West Virginia or in Kentucky, or, and some of it actually would be in Wyoming, Montana, where the, um, the other coal jobs are. But it's, it's about the fact that growth always happens in somewhat different places. And you have to think about not just moving people from old energy to new energy, but how you rebuild these communities to maybe do completely different things, of which I think tourism could be a really good one for Virginia, especially if we think about um, people maybe wanting to travel less far as they become more green aware in a way that's already happening in Europe, but hasn't really happened in the United States. So, you know, that's why it requires attention and it requires, I mean, you know, some of the groups have suggested significant financial subsidies. I mean, we're talking about jobs that are not that beneficial to the economy, that just plain pay, and they're not that many people in the United States, just paying people off may be the easiest way to deal with it. But it's something that we're going to have to deal with. Right. Just to follow up on that last point, uh, there are a lot of people in China and an aging population as well. But um, what about the Chinese side of this equation? I mean, tourism might work in West Virginia and Montana, but what about in China? Yeah, I think it's a much tougher question there. And that's why we think it may be a useful area for exploring together. Uh, as you as you know, I think in China, it's really the lack of, I mean, while service industry has grown in the last few years, it's still not where it should be. You know, I've always argued in both countries that, you know, if we actually spent as much as we would all prefer on quality education and quality healthcare, we would have good local jobs that are extremely difficult to export. So it's about education. It's about um, thinking more broadly, more long-term and, yeah, that's what's really interesting is that I think the challenges in China are actually much larger, and yet the Chinese have not really put as much attention into it. All right, thanks, Debbie. Um, Jonas, um, you get the, to present your paper to the group now. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this project, and thank you to the Penn team for doing all this work that I imagine behind the scenes has been going on for quite a while. So um, thanks for that. So the paper that I wrote for this project looks at um, US and China climate collaboration from the perspective of the industries and the sort of supply chains that are underpinning um, pinning the shift away from, from fossil fuels. And so the paper makes uh, three points and sort of points out two recommendations that I'm going to try to uh, summarize briefly in my three minutes that you've allotted me here. And so the first point that I make in the paper is really that um, if the US wants to achieve its climate goals, um, you know, or sort of previous previous climate goals, let's say for those people who, who have climate goals and, and keep global warming to below uh, two degrees Celsius, it needs to basically completely decarbonize both the power sector and the transportation sector by say 2035. Um, and China plays into that equation because China right now makes two thirds of the world's solar panels, more than one third uh, of the world's wind turbines. It makes two thirds of the world's lithium ion batteries, which we need both for electric vehicles and for storage. And China has built over the last 30 years or so pretty unique skills in manufacturing innovation in clean tech industries that are critical uh, to quickly reversing carbon emissions trends, including in the United States. Um, and so the point that I make in the paper is that it's highly unlikely that in the short run, any other economy will be able to replicate China's skills in scale up and mass production of these technologies and in the time frame that we really need to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. And so that point then leads to a second point, um, which is that China's sort of dominance in the production of these technologies doesn't mean that China reaps all the benefits. Uh, and climate related industries. Historically, clean energy technologies have come to market as a result of collaboration. Um, you know, many American technologies were commercialized in China. Uh, many European firms have worked with Chinese renewable energy firms. And so, you know, there's a global supply chain that happens. And so China being the producer doesn't mean there's nothing to gain for uh, everyone else. And right now with this massive production infrastructure in place in China, working with Chinese producers, 
probably remains the most viable option for US innovators to bring their technologies to market quickly and also at prices that actually allow them to compete with existing energy infrastructure. Um, and the third point of the paper really is that although there are, um, you know, of course, risks and collaborating with Chinese firms on the development and commercialization of these technologies for, say, American startups, IP theft, for instance, has not historically been a huge problem in the climate space. Um, China has also, you know, worked to improve the playing field somewhat. Um, you know, there are new IP courts that are starting to address some of these issues. There certainly is more that can be done, and there's a role for governments on both sides to do that. For instance, in terms of, uh, you know, improving market access for foreign firms in China in these spaces, where China has pretty systematically pushed out uh, foreign producers over time. And so, what should the U.S. do, sort of, in this current situation about? Um, the relationship. Uh, in principle, I think the US is pretty uniquely equipped to be at a sort of global frontier of clean energy innovation. Historically, the United States has been the largest investor in this research and development, um, and it continues to lead in, in many areas that are critical for fixing the climate crisis. This includes, for instance, next generation solar technologies, advanced battery chemistries, um, new building materials, smart grid technologies, uh, software, for instance, to manage complex energy systems, and so on. And so the US should use um, sort of this current moment to really accelerate its research and development investments to defend that lead and, and, and continue to build it out. And in the long run, and I think that's sort of my first recommendation, this current recession actually offers an, improve, uh, an opportunity to improve conditions domestically for segments of these clean energy industries that have not been well supported domestically. I think that lines up very strongly with, with Debbie's points. Um, manufacturing has not been uh, our strength in these industries, and that's in part because we didn't have institutions to support it. And so the creating of financing institutions for manufacturing, new investments in vocational training and technical colleges and so on would be helpful there. And so I think that competition with and the current dependence on China in these sectors should motivate us to do more to support these industries domestically and to build up um, domestic manufacturing and clean tech. We're not really currently doing that. In the short term though, and I think that's the more complicated part and it's the part that I'm sort of critical of these Green New Deal proposals and, and, and the Biden plan. In the short term, it means that we will need to rely on clean energy technologies that are currently manufactured in China. And so as soon as we you know, venture into local content regulations and, and you know, trade barriers to Chinese products in order to shore up domestic manufacturing industries, we're doing ourselves and the world a disservice. And so I think the United States should continue to address attempts by China to discriminate against foreign firms and, and provide institutional support for domestic firms to try to work with Chinese partners better. But at the same time, I think we should not lose sight of these immediate economic benefits from investing in emissions reductions outside of the manufacturing space. And, and these benefits are there even if uh, these products are manufactured abroad, including in China. And so investments in clean energy infrastructure, upgrades to the grid, sustainable transit solutions, um, renewable energy installations, building retrofits, all of this would create jobs in construction and in installation and maintenance and related service sector industries that are spread across the country and would help in the current kind of recession recovery um, while we can build up other parts of the supply chain uh, where we might um, want to compete with China eventually, but won't do it in the time frame that we have uh, to really reverse uh, the emissions trends. Great, thanks. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not trying to be confrontational, but I'm just posing what I hope are uh, fair but tough questions. Um, the paper emphasizes the uh, China's innovativeness in uh, green technologies, especially in the energy sectors. Um, and uh, that China has now ramped up production in these sectors. Uh, but you, you hear the charge uh, among some in the United States and other places that in fact, uh, China, it's not so much China's innovativeness, it's the um, uh, subsidies from the Chinese government that allowed them to underprice uh, their products in these uh, new technologies, these green technologies, uh, in order to drive out competition that they might've faced from other countries. How would you respond to that kind of charge? I mean, it's a question, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., so this is not the first time I've heard that uh, question. You know, my response usually is to say that the real, um, the real innovation in the Chinese system wasn't, for instance, that renewable energy firms got subsidized loans from state-owned banks to build out this manufacturing infrastructure. It was the fact that they got loans at all. 
Chinese banks invested some $50 billion in building out wind and solar supply chains, manufacturing supply chains domestically at a time over the last 20 years when American venture capital and European banks were not interested in funding renewable energy at that scale. And so that investment then allowed firms to become very good at manufacturing um, including all the R&D that goes into manufacturing. And so global prices for wind and solar came down by somewhat like 90% uh, since, since 2010. And so we have this, um, this, this investment, I think, that is the, the, that is the key. And so if we, um, if we wanna change that, then we need to create alternatives and currently they don't exist. Um, we are not lending that kind of money to domestic firms to do the same thing. And so, you know, I think it's not a productive conversation to sort of point fingers at China um, when this is exactly what we need to solve the climate problem. If we're not also doing something elsewhere in the world to provide an alternative to Chinese production. Okay. Um, so the next question I have is, um, I, I took from the paper, and again, you know, maybe I misread these things, uh, that, that there was this idea, at least in the short term, maybe not in the long term, of an implicit division of labor in which the United States would mainly be focused on basic research and development uh, in new clean energies, energy products and processes and all that stuff, um, whereas China would focus on commercializing and producing the new products that uh, come out of American basic research and development. Um, and that you've indicated that that's kind of been the track record for each country where their strength lies in this area. Uh, but doesn't this imply a willingness for uh, the United States and for China both to decide to depend on the other one? Uh, and is it realistic in an era of sharper US-China competition um, for them to do, continue doing this or look forward to doing this when they're becoming, uh, in fact, more wary of depending on one another? In other words, even if it's objectively desirable to follow this approach for climate reasons, maybe narrow economic reasons in terms of comparative advantage, uh, is it politically feasible? For the United States and China to, to embrace this approach? I mean, I think there's two points to that answer. First is th this division of labor is the current reality in these sectors that's basically grown since the mid 1990s, right? And so that is the current situation that we're dealing with. And of course, it's politically very tempting uh, to try to shift that division of labor. And I don't think in the long run, there's anything inevitable about this sort of division of labor. The problem in the short term with these political attempts to shift things uh, is that they harm our efforts and the speed at which we can address emissions reductions. And so you've seen this in the past. I think the renewable energy space has always been uh, especially vulnerable to trade tensions, for instance, because you're essentially taking taxpayer money and spending it on products. And so the temptation is very large to then make uh, these subsidies dependent, for instance, on local content regulations. And we see this in the United States, for instance, at the subnational level, where certain kinds of renewable portfolio standards require manufacturing of these technologies within the state, or they only apply to renewable energy produced in the state, right? So we do this at the national level, but also at the subnational level. Um, and historically, we've had a lot of trade conflict, um, especially in the solar space. The problem is that these tariffs don't really tend to shift manufacturing back to the United States. What they do do um, is raise the price of, um, of these technologies domestically and harm the industry. And so what we've seen, for instance, is that in recent trade rounds in the solar space, it's been the US solar industry that's been most opposed to these kinds of tariffs because their installation and service workers are the ones that are going to be affected by higher prices and it's going to make solar less competitive um, with other sources of energy, right? And so I think it's a, it's a problem, um, sort of a political problem that there is this temptation to try to do that. Um, and it can be solved in the long run by these long-term investments in production here. But I think in the short term, we're, we're stuck with this division of labor and we're not really doing much to, to try to create an alternative to it. All right, well, you're gonna get stuck with my last question here, which I could have posed to any of the panelists, uh, but I'm sure you'll, you'll answer it for the others, um, which is uh, everybody has emphasized in their papers the important role that the United States and China play in addressing the challenges of climate change. Uh, and have pointed out several times the a uh, large contribution to greenhouse gases from the United States and China, a large fraction uh, of the problem is because of these two countries. Uh, and of course, the project is on US-China relations, but we know this is a global problem that requires a global response. 
Uh, and I'm wondering whether the focus on bilateral approaches to cooperation may be setting aside questions of um, the considerations that need to be multilateral and whether the, uh, you know, the periodic climate change conferences, Paris, Copenhagen, or whatever, um, whether that's adequate to the task or is there a need for uh, institutions, maybe not global in scale, but certainly bring in all of the major players, not just the US and China, to uh, try to, uh, who else needs to be brought in to address these problems besides the United States and China, even if the two, these two countries take the lead? I mean, I think the US and China, because they account for 40% of emissions are you know, central to this task. We, we can't really achieve any of the outcomes that we need to get to if we, if we don't involve them. But I think for instance, a, a US alliance with Europe would be a, a very helpful competitive counterpoint to some of China's investments internationally. I think that green financing institutions that provide an alternative, for instance, to the Belgian Road Initiative in the developing world, um, set up by Europe and the US you know, collectively, would provide uh, an impetus for China to commit to green goals for the Belgian Road, for instance, right? So I think there is within that global framework, which, uh, you know, in some ways, since the Paris Agreement has been much more about domestic goals, domestic politics, and sort of holding each other accountable. But within that framework, there's lots of space, I think, for, uh, for alliances and, and for competition. And I think in that sense, competition is good for business, right? We, we want to um, create green, green alternatives, and you want to make sure that other countries sort of feel like they need to they need to compete. And China has done this, you know, in many ways effectively. China's domestic goals for electric vehicles, for instance, have, um, you know, motivated global auto companies that have been very uh, reluctant to invest in, in EV technologies to change their mind. And so Germany now has, you know, EV targets that exist only because the German automakers have given up opposition to that because they've had to develop these technologies for the Chinese market anyway. And so, you know, I think this is a sort of a space where you can have multiple levels of, of kind of collaboration and competition. Um, and the global framework is not the only, uh, the only game in town. I think it needs to be sustained by these kinds of bilateral agreements that hopefully keep everyone in check. Okay, thanks. So now we're gonna to turn to the portion of the program that uh, takes questions from the audience that have appeared in the Q and A box. Um, I'll tell the panelists if you want to unmute your uh, microphones, and I'm assuming that people will uh, be able to jump in as they see fit. Some questions are aimed at particular panelists, others are more general. And the first one isn't aimed at any particular panelist, but says, um, if the United States and China do opt for cooperation of one sort or another, uh, what chance is there for their, them to make joint efforts at mitigating this problem in parts of the world where climate change is already uh, causing problems of displacement and forced migration, uh, as well as conflicts both internal uh, and across borders. Anyone can answer. So mitigation is global, right? We need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide um, and other greenhouse gases that we're emitting into this one global atmosphere that we have. And that's especially important for the most vulnerable parts of the world. Um, had a lengthy discussion yesterday about Bangladesh, where you know a third of the population is at risk of being inundated in this century. You know, small islands, most um, developing countries that are heavily dependent on agriculture are much more vulnerable right now than developed countries. And much, much more investment needs to be put into adaptation and assistance for developing countries. A constructive US-China relationship that feeds into the global effort, into these periodic um, discussions, the, the COPs that we have annually that um, could actually talk about how to you know, funnel more aid to developing countries which also need to transform their energy systems, but more urgently also need to just adapt to an already changing climate could be one of the benefits of a more cooperative world situation. The US has really, the Europeans have much been much more likely to step up on this than the US. And we have failed over and over again in financial commitments that we have made previously. 
So it's really a question of getting a US public to think about these investments as positive and caring. Um, and that's a huge political challenge. Yeah, and, and I suppose you know, both the United States and Europe in particular will, uh, should see these as risks that lead to migration towards those jurisdictions, right? That's probably more so than the case with, with China. So um, I, I guess the publics in those places need to realize that investments in other countries for adaptation, those sorts of things accrue to the benefit of uh, the countries domestically as well. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Actually, there's a couple of questions that have been posed uh, at various times here that really get at this question of uh, burden sharing between the two countries and whether it's real or not, this perception that uh, each side feels as though they've shouldered enough of the burden uh, and the other side is not shouldering their fair share. I think we saw some of this raised in the debate last night in a comment from President Trump about China. So um, any panelists want to talk about this question of burden sharing, whether it's a matter of um, a, being a real problem, or whether it's a matter of managing perceptions. Um, maybe I'll jump in here. I, or Sorry, Alex, did you want to? Oh, go ahead, no, please. Um, you know, I think this is sort of a common point that's being made. And I think it's in, in the US domestically is often abused as a way of getting out of um, having to make difficult decisions here. I think China is sort of being seen as the scapegoat. This is not to say that China doesn't have uh, you know, a lot of work to do. Um, you know, these carbon neutrality commitments are, are wonderful, but there's a long road ahead. And there are currently coal plants under construction in China that are not compatible with these kinds of uh, targets. But China has built these industries that now has an economic sort of incentive in pushing climate policy. It's setting domestic regulations that are in the direction of climate policy. And if we look at the US, we have not really sort of, you know, done our share. And so uh, we are rolling back emission standards for vehicles. Um, you know, we have, we're threatening to pull out of the Paris Agreement. And so, you know, I think the environment here is not one where we're even trying to kind of, you know, carry our, our share of the burden. Um, and so I think it's a sort of problematic way of, of um, pitching uh, the, the problem because, it, you know, I don't think it's very productive, I think, um, for us domestically um, and for the relationship that I, you know, outlined we need uh, to, to make progress quickly now. Yeah, I think the big issue is we need more burden for both. It's not a, I mean, the issue is China's been moving more quickly than the US for the last several years. Um, the US has actually moved back. It's the cafe standards and the lack of our clean power plan. I mean, we have really pulled back. But the point is that just even meeting Paris commitments is not going to be enough. And we need a step change everywhere. And so this sort of burden sharing is a fruitless conversation. Yeah, and the argument about burden sharing probably comes the most vocally out of the Republican Party in the United States as a way to sort of say we shouldn't do anything. Right? That's been a, a longstanding objection since the days of the Kyoto Protocol. I think since Paris, the way that both countries have talked about this has just been different. You know, there was a lot of fighting more than 10 years ago at Copenhagen about all of these different metrics of relative responsibility, about historical emissions, per capita emissions, absolute emissions, these types of things. But uh, you know, China's not fighting as, as hard. They still take technically, you know, talk about the common but differentiated responsibilities, but they're not relying on that as a, as a reason to not act. I think this more affirm, affirmative idea that you get benefits from acting is certainly the paradigm, the way it's framed in China. And you know, it's part of the, all, the, the industrial policy that Debbie's talking about. They see the benefits that come out of trying to dominate industries that do not have established incumbents that already control those industries. And the US hasn't really taken that approach, but it's not, not that nothing has been going on in the US. You know, there has been action in certain quarters in the US. And I think that should be the model going forward. I think I, I, if I can jump in with one quick related point, I think that there's, you know, climate policy in both places comes from very different um, origins. In China, domestically, there's been a lot of pushback within the government against climate policy and the way that 
climate policy has been sort of advocated for within the central government in Beijing has been to advocate for um, energy security essentially domestically and as a kind of a future export industry and sort of you know economic benefits from climate policy and we have not really done that in the US and so um, I think you know this sort of this burden sharing argument just points to very different uh, dynamics uh, that carry carry policy in these spaces and those places and I think the sort of economic incentive that China now has domestically um, also gives me hope that they're going to continue down that mm -hmm. road. Okay, thanks. Um, we had actually two questions uh, from different people uh, that are on the coal question. And for those who don't follow these issues as closely as the three of you do, or the four of you, if you include Angel, um, you know, there's lots of reports of China within the last year or two licensing more coal-fired power plants than people had thought they would if they were going to abide by their commitments uh, to scale back. Uh, lots of reports that the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's mentioned in some of the papers, the Belt and Road Initiative has entailed, in some sense, exporting coal-fired power plants to other countries that are uh, part of these uh, Belt and Road projects, especially in Pakistan. Uh, and so the questions are, the two questions amount to, um, is this going to slow down or stop? Is China going to continue to emphasize uh, coal? Or you know, when are we going to see it begin to uh, cut back? Uh, and the other part of the question was, does the United States have any leverage to um, induce China? to reduce its support for its coal industry at home and abroad. Maybe I can uh, take that. That's uh, what I focus on in the, in the paper. You know, so those are two areas of risk, right? The, the signs over the last few years that China was licensing more coal plants was problematic. And we need to see signals in the 14 five-year plan going forward over the next few years that that is going to stop, right? And uh, Export of coal is also a dynamic that there's been a lot of uh, discussion about greening the Belt and Road and these types of things. But in terms of sort of hard action, we need to see more. So uh, the, the main sort of detail we've, we've seen uh, since the 2060 Carbon Neutrality Pledge from Tsinghua University and their research group suggests right now that deep decarbonization doesn't begin for until 2030. That's a little bit, that's troubling as well, right? So we would wanna see signals earlier. And so right now, because there's so much in flux, in my view, what I would say is any of those areas are, are difficulties and risks. And we need to just in the next year, you know, next spring when the 14 five-year plan is coming out, we need to see every year steps that are starting to restrict uh, these types of uh, problems. I think domestically, the the efforts to implement the, the coal cap have been a little bit stop and start. I still think they have a tendency to sort of license more plants than they ever plan to build. And, you know, many plants in China are running at less than full capacity. So I think there's going to be a big fight over this stuff. And I tend to think that the direction that we've seen over the last decade where the people who want to control it are, are ultimately going to win. I think I'm fairly optimistic. Internationally, I think we really, it goes back to what Jonas was saying about actually providing some alternatives. I mean, if you think about, I mean, so first of all, alternative sources of financing so that countries are looking for other options, but also we need to think about um, alternative sources of energy and what works in different countries. If you think about the problems that Pakistan faces in terms of just having enough energy supply, especially with the imminent sort of decline of power from the Indus River dams, um, they were looking for enormous amounts of baseload electricity and the Chinese have provided that to them, not only in the form of coal fired power plants, they're also building nuclear power plants in, in, in Pakistan. So one of the big issues is that there's a lot of optimism, some of it actually going to play out in India in terms of improvements in storage for renewable energy, where, um, you know, Wind and, wind and solar are going to be a much more realistic baseload in the future than they are right now. And so the question will be whether 
we can start getting those things into countries like Pakistan relatively quickly. I don't think the choice for Pakistan was whether to do a wind plant or a coal plant. It was whether to do a Chinese coal plant or a Korean coal plant. And so I think we need to realize what countries are looking at now in terms of options. And I just throw out Korea as an example. It could be Japan, it could be Siemens. Um, you know, but we, we, if we care about what's gonna happen in these other countries, we actually have to think about the options for them. I would also add that if you look at the Chinese coal sector domestically, um, you know, there's both disconcerting news about the development of things, but if you look at the ownership of the existing coal fleet, the central government holds, has some sort of control over the vast majority of plants that exist currently, either as a co-investor or as an outright owner. Um, and so, you know, if the center decided to now really start moving on, um, on, you know, on progress towards this carbon neutrality goal, it does actually have the tools to very directly affect um, shutdowns, for instance, of plants in ways that in other places you would have to have much more complicated emissions trading rules or some other way of making these places, uh, these plants uncompetitive. And so, you know, to Debbie's point that a lot of them have not been profitable, that's also only been po possible because they've had state support, but that now also gives the government the ability to accelerate changes in the power sector. So there are some questions that the uh, panelists have been answering in the Q&A box that uh, I think the rest of the uh, people watching might want to hear about. And uh, one very interesting one here was the idea that um, this questioner asked, uh, had a concern that the um, idea, you know, the comparison, the parallel I thought of when I read this question was uh, the pursuit of uh, a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and it's the idea that if the US and China are kind of competing, which sounds like a good thing inherently, competing to produce new technologies uh, that will help uh, fight climate change, that each of them might really want to make the breakthrough. Uh, and they may see this as a way to, to burnish uh, or you know, polish up their international reputation. I mean, the, uh, the concept of soft power was introduced in the discussion. Um, but then they might not be so willing to share because what they really want to do is make the breakthrough, maybe make profits from uh, the fruits of their research and development, uh, but also to profit in the sense of saying, look at the contribution we're, we're able to make uh, to fighting global climate change. And it's our system, whether it's the US system or the Chinese system that made this possible, kind of a parallel to, as I said, to this uh, pursuit of a vaccine. Um, do you think that's, that might be the way this plays out as a consequence of this deepening rivalry and competition between the US and China? Well, look at how nicely the vaccine competition is playing out. We're gonna have lots of options and we're gonna have lots of evidence to see which ones work better. So, I mean, in general, competition is a positive thing. I mean, I think Jonas's point earlier that this hasn't been an area where there's been a lot of IP theft. Um, one of the things about energy systems is they actually take an awfully long time before they actually get widely distributed so that they're often out of patent anyway. Um, but I think, you know, if people view it as a co competition and that there are options, it's, it improves things. Um, I do think there are areas where the Chinese have been the only ones really pushing to fully develop things commercially. Um, you know, Jonas talks about renewable energy, but I think that's also true with carbon capture and storage. If, you know, the world puts serious limits on emissions, the Chinese are geared up to basically sell these systems to coal-fired power plants around the world. And so, you know, I think other countries, including both the US and Europe, should be thinking about where we want to encourage our own industries, which is why I think industrial policy is a good idea. But I don't see the downside to competition. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that, right? Competition, the the idea that the competition would generate only one sort of viable solution that would get locked up by one side seems like the less plausible op, op, uh, result than 
competition generating a, a lot of ideas that uh, countries can benefit from and better ideas. So I think if you believe in that basic principle, I think uh, there's not as much to worry about as the, uh, here as the question was just. I also, th I also think that there is a sort of mismatch often between the economic reality in these sectors and political goals. I mean, these are industries for the most part that have emerged globally after globalization was a thing, right? They came in after China joined the WTO. And so what you have are thousands and thousands of suppliers around the world that are making parts needed for all of these different things that we require. And so even if we wanted to have sort of, you know, the Chinese government has been pushing this for a while, this sort of techno nationalism where everything's supposed to be sourced domestically, they are too. Um, and they haven't been able to do it because it is a global system and you can find everything within national borders. And it would take a long time, I think, to roll that back. And so within that competition, we will also have to rely on each other and you know, buy batteries from here and lithium from somewhere else and, and sort of engage this global infrastructure uh, that exists for these technologies just, just because of when these industries became uh, viable sectors and in sort of the, the timeline of global economic change. Yeah, one thing I wanted to note, I think Jonas is right that the sort of local content requirements of some of the Biden proposals are alarming, but I thought some of the things he said last night in the debate were less alarming. I think we have had this experiment in who gets hurt with high tariffs. And he's well aware and spoke explicitly about the damage to US employment from things like the steel tariffs. And we had a similar impact from the solar tariffs, right? Because all of the fabrication, installation, all the everything but making the little panels themselves is all done in the United States. And there's a lot of jobs involved. So I think there is some awareness of how um, Im importing components actually can be highly beneficial and more of a constituency for getting rid of these tariffs than there was before people actually experienced what having them was like. So we're getting near the end, um, but someone raised a question that um, might be good to address because we really haven't talked about much about it, but if we had been talking about this topic maybe 10 years ago or five years ago, we'd be talking a lot about carbon trading schemes. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about that today. Um, to what extent does this idea, or is this now passe? To what extent does it play a role in uh, US policy in this era? area? China's thinking about uh, fighting climate change. And is there room for cooperation in terms of devising uh, carbon trading schemes that can be part of the solution? So I don't, China, I don't, yeah, go ahead, Debbie. Yeah. China actually has um, geared up a carbon trading system and it is part of their system. I think all of the evidence is that it's actually a pretty limited part of their total mitigation, that most of their mitigation comes from um, standards, quotas, things like that. In the United States, when we were talking about a cap and trade system, if you actually read the bill and my old um, employer World Resources Institute did an analysis, you know, at least half of the Waxman-Markey bill, also the mitigation would come from standards, quotas, not from the cap and trade part itself. The Europeans still have a cap and trade um, system as well. Part of China's interest in developing one was to integrate with these other ones so that they could sell credits. So I think cap and trade is going to continue to exist. It doesn't seem to have a great deal of political appeal within the US except you know, California and parts of the Northeast. It isn't what anybody's proposing for a national system at this point. So I think market-based mechanisms of which cap and trade is one and carbon taxes are the other will continue to be a part of the story, but the real growth right now is a focus on industrial policy. Yeah, I, I would add, you know, I, I think Markets and command and control have been part of a, a hot debate for many decades in uh, US or just in regulatory discussions generally. And, and part of the dynamic of the US has reflected our, our sense of should the government be directing things versus markets. The way it's actually played out is a lot of our successes as Debbie suggests come from just traditional command and control regulation, you know, done with 
you know, transparency and participation and an ability to sort of modify in a way so it's not sort of draconian and authoritarian. And markets have played a role, but they are not playing the central role that uh, uh, many early proponents have, have suggested. I think in California, it's not to say that uh, it's, it's something you don't want to have. I think in California, it's something that uh, provides flexibility and it helps to raise revenue that can be channeled towards climate and air uh, um, uh, actions and policies and, and these sorts of things. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's part of a, uh, a comprehensive package, but I think I'm glad that we are actually moving past the days where there was almost this kind of ideological battle about which uh, instrument was the right one. I think most people recognize say that all of these need to be in play and they're all part of the story. I think there's also just an overall shift. Um, I mean, in the debate, as, as Debbie pointed out, away from carbon pricing as, as sort of the main tool it was this kind of very elegant scheme. But we now see that basically in many parts of the world, traditional fossil fuel technologies are no longer competitive with wind and solar, right? I mean, US coal plants have been shutting down um, because they're too expensive, not because we've had some sort of carbon trading system in this country. And so these brute investments in new technologies and then scaling them up and bringing down the cost changes the reality completely. And so you in many ways don't need this anymore um, because we now have alternatives that outcompete um, that outcompete, uh, you know, the, the kind of fossil fuel sectors. And so, you know, for this reason that the Trump administration early on was talking about subsidies for coal plants in this country, right? I mean, this is sort of where we're at. And, um, you know, we need to bring this to other sectors. The power sector isn't the only thing we need to fix. But I think there, there's been a realization that if you get uh, the basics right, you can compete with, um, with fossil fuel industries on price. Well, thanks. Uh, and I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, I hope those of you who are uh, attending today's webinar have learned as much as I have from our uh, contributors. I encourage you to uh, go to the website and uh, have a look at the papers. Uh, they each have a, an executive summary at the beginning if you want to refresh your memory about what the main arguments were. Um, in addition, on our website, we weekly put out after the event is held on the following Tuesday, uh, findings and recommendations uh, summarizing uh, the discussion that we had today as well as the papers. Uh, and next week, uh, the final webinar in the series will be on Friday at 1230 again, and it will look at uh, questions of technology, obviously a very sensitive and important topic in US-China relations, especially within the past year or so. So um, thank you for attending, and I hope as many as possible will uh, attend next Friday's session as well. Bye-bye.